Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining in the session. Like the Agile community, I'm really happy to be here. I uh, really like hanging out with Agile people. I'm not a Scrum Master, I'm not scaled Agile, anything. Um, I guess we draw a lot. I draw a lot on many things, but uh, my core competency is like a lot of uncertainty. Um, so transformation innovation. And we just have a tremendous overlap, but I think I'm drawn to the whole community always because there's, there's this nice people focus and I just feel very comfortable. So I'm really glad uh, coming back here again, being able to present again. And I would love you to engage a little bit. I know it's hard, but um, I've done this presentation, not this one, another one last year. And that was a bit, uh, it's psychologically a bit hard because like you have no, uh, you don't see anybody, you don't know what the other people are thinking and so on. So at some point it might get to you. It got to me last time. So a bit of engagement is great, right? So saying, I don't understand it, like anything critical, uh, any question, a thumbs up is really much appreciated. Yeah? Can start right now. So I also, before, before we go into it, um, you see Chromatics logo down there. Um, that is my, uh, that's a partner organization based in the US and much, much of what is in this presentation comes from them. And uh, yeah, can't credit them enough. Uh, so just to keep that in mind. Thank you. Cool. So we will start with the problem space today. Just talk a little bit about the issue. It's like, why do we need innovation? Like, why do we talk even about innovation accounting? Why, why do we need something different? It's kind of, that's kind of the question, I guess, that we want to quickly explore. And so one of the main issues we're trying to solve or to make better is the business case. And um, trying to engage a little bit right now. So maybe one or two, if you want to punch something in here in the in the chat. So who's who thinks? Wh what are the problems with the business case in an innovation context? Like if one of you can, if one of you can type something in here while I speak, that would be fantastic. And uh, well, basically, how do projects get chosen? How to potentially, all right, great, too hard, all right, thank you very much for engaging, you're, you're, you're champions, tangible outcomes, fantastic, so all right, timelines, fantastic, can we, estimating the value is super, super difficult, fantastic, and why is it so difficult, can, ob can ob objectives be valued, risk, oh man, the engagement is, is fantastic, you make me very happy right now, risk, great. Okay, so we see there is risk and reward goes together. So there's a lot of risk and we have a lot of risk, like we, there's a lot of uncertainty simply. And the business case pretends often to have the certainty or tries to find ways to create that, make it look like this certainty. Uh, great, and we don't even know what customers want yet. And do we meet their demands and to what price, fantastic. Downside risk, fantastic. So, oh, let's read it again, fantastic. So, in specifically innovation context, we have very minimal data, right? We have mostly qualitative data. They might come in this kind of form, we're collecting them. Value proposition canvas, business model canvases. Uh, we have uh, personas we use, we work with. So we have a lot of qualitative data and, we, and we're very good at it. We're very good at it. Like we, we're getting better and better at actually understanding customer needs, forming better questionnaires, uh, having little experiments in the beginning, empathizing, all these sort of things. But at the end of the day, all of that stuff has to be translated into something that looks like this. And that's, that's just no good because we know it doesn't really work. And for once, it creates a massive disconnect between those who come up with these ideas, 
who create backlogs, who see a chance, who see a glimmer, like a glimmer of hope, so to say, like here we have something, we have a few ideas. And those who have to then like the business sponsor, the finance department and so on, like how can they possibly really understand each other? And the systems within companies, as we know, at the end of the day, you have to calculate a number. And so that's something where the space where we thrive, the space that we love, the space where we try to solve more problems, um, really for both parties, really, right? Uh, we talk a lot about empathy with our customers, um, but I think we should also have empathy with like the CFO and see how we can tackle the problem from, from that angle. Um, I wrote an article, I shared a link with you together with, with Tristan, and uh, we identified actually three distinct issues with the business case. As you said, they're not accurate, right? And that present value, like one number. We try, we're asking folks like for one number five years down the track. And like, we don't know. We don't know the tech we're using. We don't know our customer acquisition costs. We, 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 don't, we really don't know, but we have to do this. And so we're basically forced to make things up in a sense it, there's, there's no other way to get it over the line. Like we have, uh, we have certain expectations. We know these expectations in an innovation in an uncertain context are even higher because we know we get discounted, right? So we get this heavily discounted because any business sponsor, any, any CFO knows that that's risky and that's the tool, how they do it. So what do we have to do in return? We have to like make up a higher attempt. We have to pretend the market is larger or whatever it is to make this, to get this over the line. It's like the system forces us to, to make up, to make it all look a little bit better than it really is. And uh, lastly, it's, it's just not testable. Um, it is testable, like ROI is testable. In four or five years, we know whether or not the ROI happened, right? So that's really the problem. Like we wanna know much earlier, we wanna have better predictability and we wanna know much earlier whether or not something has any hope of survival or not. Like, does that make sense? Is that summed up a little bit or are there any questions at this point? How many people dropped out already? Not too many people are coming in. Great. Thank you. Testing the hypothesis. Yeah, in a sense, that is, if you want, it's, it's not really phrased as a hypothesis, but right. Yeah, like the ROI is, is at least an assumption, right? So we're assuming X, whatever ROI. And yes, it's, it's test, it will be tested. The market will test it. Um, yeah, and we know it's anyway, early validation. So what we're looking for exactly is early validation, ideally in, in a quantifiable, like where we try to bridge that, what we're doing quantifiably with, a, with a, a an, all the qualitative knowledge we have with a, with a quantifiable model. And we, we're looking for something that, that we're looking for something that's testable a lot earlier, right? And so, the solution, so to say, for that, or we believe the solution is, is actually is innovation accounting. So how many, how many people are vaguely familiar with like with innovation accounting? Like have used anything that they would call, how many people used, can anybody just say a thumbs up or so if they have used something they would call innovation accounting? Sweet. One person, hands up, fantastic. Yeah, if we're not together, otherwise I would ask what it means for you and so on, but uh, maybe we skip that, might be a bit, bit challenging, but great, fantastic. So to introduce the concept, it was, it was coined by Eric Ries and um, ever since he coined that, the term gets broader and broader and broader, but to bring it home, it's good to look at it from this um, perspective of levels of innovation metrics. So, when we measure innovation, we usually break it up into individuals like skills, how teams are performing. That is often very different from how projects perform. 
like a team can do exactly the right thing at the right time, but the project uh, doesn't necessarily need to succeed for the team to do really good work. So those are different, we need different ways of measuring that. Then we're looking at the project and that's really what we're talking about today. And that's traditionally what innovation counting meant. So how can we make that a, a comparability, a predictability? How can we uh, have lead indicators and all these sort of things? Uh, we can look at the portfolio at the funnel and we can also look at the ecosystem and look at broader, uh, 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 broader components, broader limiting factors to, to, the, to, build the, to building out the ecosystem. So we are looking at the project today. So how do we get from something that looks like this or like this or anything else, plug any, plug any tool in there to this in a sensible way and not really to this. This is not really what we want. Like, but we want a spreadsheet. We want to talk the, the language of numbers, ideally. So this thing is way too specific. Like we're asking entrepreneurs or uh, innovators to come up with a number we know they will never hit. Most likely it's underneath that. I guess just statistically, like that's just most likely the case. But can there be single number? Yeah, so, but it's basically what we do, right? Tell me the ROI. Um, yeah, we get to that. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Um, even best case, worst case scenarios, we can talk about that. They're pretty, they're not very good. Um, so this thing is probably if, like, it's not very true. It's not very accurate. And most of all, it's not testable. So what we want is actually something. It's a bit like when you go to an innovator and you ask them, like, give me the ROI, it's a bit like going into a meteorologist and say, hey, can you, uh, can you tell me where the, where, the, um, where the storm that is just forming, where the hurricane that is just forming is about to hit in five days? What will the meteorologist say? Like, get out of here. I can't do that. I can't tell you where exactly and in what state and at what time and with what force this thing would hit the coast. They can't do that. But it doesn't mean that they can't provide valuable information to make good decisions, real world decisions. Like most likely we should evacuate now, right? And, and that is really the best thing that we can do. And we can do that. It is basically a range. It is a range of possible outcomes. And the further you go into the future, the further the range obviously is because you, you know less and less and less. It becomes less predictable, right? But the earlier we can quantify, the earlier we can make good decisions. The earlier we can make good decisions, the earlier we can pull the plug. And the earlier we can pull the plug, the more ideas we can basically test. And that's how we increase the, the likelihood of success. Was that too much? Did I have a bit too enthusiastic or something? Any questions? So we're looking for something that is true. Like we want to tell the truth, like to our best ability. Uh, as accurate as possible and ideally testable. How does that look in, in our context? It looks something like that, ranges. We're looking for ranges. We're looking for the most likely outcome. That's what we're trying to get to today. Yeah, a thumbs up or something. I'm just giving it a moment. Any questions? I drink something. All right. Are people dropping out? 44. How do we get to do this? Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, exactly by what's likely. And if it's not, and if there is that enough possibility, 
that it, if it's at least possible, then what we can do is we can, that's the basis of a metered funding approach. We can put some money in, do some experimentation, get some information back and narrow down this chart basically. Yeah. So how much does the range help? Let's pause that question and, and uh, maybe ask that again later, if that's okay. I, I have a feeling it might be clear. So the way we, we, we designed this process or to, 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 bridge, to bridge the gap there between qualitative stuff, early research and a hurricane chart, um, the range helps to narrow down and identify possibilities. Great, should we get to this? I will, I think we're really good on time. I hope we have, have some good time later on as well. Fantastic. Uh, okay. So really quickly, an overview, and then we go into the, specific, into the specifics of this. So we wanna organize our qualitative data. We're using storyboarding, journey mapping, storyboarding. We use that to, to take out the metrics we need, the lead indicators, funnel metrics. Then we get folks to draw this up, the visual financial model. So really just a tiny step further, understanding the loops of the business model, kind of the things we're looking for, like specifically virality. Then we put that, take those numbers, put that into a spreadsheet for the first time. And then we define ranges for those numbers, basically. So it's a little bit much for now, but we just move on. So storyboarding and metrics. What we want to achieve is we want to have of this idea, we want to look at this business model. That's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to establish a new business model and we're looking at the inputs and outputs. So what are they? And this is really, really helpful. Like this is probably the most helpful tool you can really use out there. You say, all right, sorry, take a breath. Like, so we're usually working, like you will see two examples today. One is uh, like an Instagram kind of app idea. And the other one is usually we're using a restaurant. Like we're keeping a very, very simple. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the ideas, uh, the, the, the examples we go with, right? Okay, so in this case, it, it doesn't really matter too much, but somebody is somewhere taking pictures. Uh, the pictures are really nice, right? And you know, we see this with the smiley faces. And then the assumption here is that they go to an editor and they get a wonderful photo back, right? Uh, and then they're happy and then they share it with people and then they get more social engagement and credibility and everybody's happy, right? So, this is, this is fantastic because it tells us exactly the customer journey. Like what is our assumption here that people are actually doing? They come, they see an ad, they download the app, uh, they pay X for it, uh, they pay after three months, they pay for whatever it is, right? At a certain time, they perform a certain action. It's exactly what we're assuming. And so when we narrow down the main variables of the story, then we can look at uh, what we call the happenings metrics. So how many trips do they take? How many, uh, how many pictures? Whoa, this just had a life of its own. It's a lot of numbers up there and, and, and words, but uh, if we assume they take poor shots, then how, what's the, how many poor shots do they take? Do they apply filters and so on? This is in a sense what we still call vanity metrics. They don't really tell us, really tell us what are we doing. But what we can do from there, and you see every step should be simple, even though I'm rushing through it. Um, I, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with that. And you do, actually, could you, could you verify that for me for, for a second? Some of you are like that, that makes, that makes total sense, I think, right? Or not? Like, does it not make sense is my question to anybody here so far. Like I do, you do journey, journey mapping anyway, right? And so 
the question here, this is what we're looking for. This is really the base of everything. We're looking for actionable metrics is what we say. We need actionable metrics to build a hypothesis-driven financial model. So that's how you can get it. You're actually looking at rates or ratios. That's what we need to, perfect, thank you. Yeah, if you can identify mistakes, that would be great. You know, always happy to improve, obviously, just as happy. There are still assumptions. Thank you for pointing out. Absolute assumptions, 100%. I have to say that when you get entrepreneurs and teams to do this and to do this well, they're thinking very hard about their assumptions. It's a lot harder to, to argue for absolute craziness, right? So 100% still, I usually see improvements, what I would, I would say. Okay, so how many pictures do actually need to be improved? Uh, and then in this case, uh, yeah. At what point in our journey do they create an account? At what point in our journey do they pay, right? This is just, this is just a highlight like example. So we've basically made it from here to here. So we organized all this qualitative stuff and we've got our metrics out already. The next part is we're not even touching a spreadsheet now. Let's just go to the whiteboard, let's go to mural or what have you and draw this up at a high level. So from here to here. The pirate metric framework, um, we're just going through it without really mentioning it too much. Like it's gonna be, an, it's gonna be a, 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 that's basically a fundamental metric system here we're using. It's, it's great because we always look at it as a funnel, right? So we look at customer behavior in this funnel. So how many vis visitors come now? Uh, we went from the app, forgive me for that. I should change that in the future, really. I have the same example and the same slide. Uh, we're looking at a, at a restaurant now. Correct, correct, they can be 100%, 100%. We can, we can make, we can actually stop there, not do this, not do anything else and already uh, try to kill our assumptions right there. Like we can already look like, have, have a feeling, have a voting, have a two by two, uh, like uh, impact over, over uncertainty, business impact over uncertainty two by two. Uh, just from that storyboard and prioritize risk and uncertainty. 100%, 100%, um, I'm just uh, 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 responding to the chat, right? And in a qualitative way, go out, gather more information against that, 100%. And that's what we do and it's beautiful. And I recommend everybody to just do it. But we're looking for a model, right? We're looking for something where oh, we've got 10 ideas and we need to choose and we want to, uh, go further with it and we're looking for a quantifiable. So we will translate this into visitors, customers, money as an output. It could might as well be impact. Also, yeah, the challenge is often I find like a little bit like when you have internal projects, like my examples don't necessarily translate too well. So if anybody wants to jump in and see how they can translate it into like internal organizational, like in, in large organizations, internal projects that you might be very busy with and see how we can like bridge what we're talking about here to, 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 to internal stuff. Very good. Cool. But really it's about understanding the loops and it's, it's not a minor thing. We will see later the loops are really what makes or break a, a, a really good business model. Retention, obviously, right? If we have folks using our product, like, I don't know, a fidgy spinner and then they throw it away and that's it, right? Or they come, they take one picture, they go away, that's it. Like, sure, might be okay, might be okay in certain circumstances, um, specifically if you wanna have, yeah. Retention is usually, is one of the big uh, 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 levers of growth. So without retention, you usually have a big problem growing anything in any sustainable way. 
And so then, then we look at uh, referral. Insanely, incredibly important, specifically when we want to have any, any hockey stick curve in our business model. If you want to argue for anything remotely like that, we see later, it's very, very important. Um, and they might refer at different points, right? They might be paying money first and then refer, or they might come in and then they refer to three people and then refer to one later and so on and so on. But these are very essential assumptions we need to talk about. And this really helps to align the team, to align stakeholders, to, to talk to each other, right? And not sitting in front of some spreadsheet and putting some numbers in here and there, right? Like it's, it's fantastic just for, you know, team cohesions, I suppose, or whatever the right word is. Uh, yeah, returning visitors, there's, there's so many possibilities for loops. Uh, we can subdivide this funnel a little bit different and really understand our business model better. And from there, we can take what we had earlier and put those numbers in. As you said, they're all assumptions, 100%. But what we should have at this point, at least, is we thought about it really hard. There needs to be a, there needs to be a logic, otherwise this thing breaks. There's this, right? There's, there's a certain sanity check. Um, uh, and we have all these actionable metrics in there. I think I forgot something else. Right, let's let's pause for a second. Does that make sense so far? Did we take, did we go from like a business model canvas with sticky notes and research and everything that we managed to get here in a concise way? Does that make sense so far? What does not make sense rather? Hardly anybody dropping off, that can't be that. Great, right. correct. They have different, and that's a great point, right? Because like, if we knew the business model already, then we don't really need to do the fancy stuff. If you know your business model, you can benchmark every metric. You know the industry standard. You know the costing. You know your conversion rate. You know, like how much you're going to deviate. Like if if it's not innovative, you know the business model. That's the problem. You don't know your business model. And if you have to write something up for it that takes you five days or whatever and make these huge cases and make up all the stuff and then you can't even test it at the end, then you have a very bad tool for making decisions. So the question is, how long will this take you if you have a trained team and, and you get to understanding your business model? You yeah, not a standard financial timeline, otherwise, right? I agree. Well, people do it and people are incredibly good at it, but it's usually the people who are really good at telling some sort of financial story, right? You make, like, you don't really have much. So you win in this environment if you can, you know, do like, I call it a number novel. Right? And you're writing a story there with your spreadsheet. And then if you're a really good writer, then you can write a great text around it and make this business case. And then you have really good political alliances within the company and that's, that's how it works. So we're looking for other ways. We're looking for systems and repeatable processes that, can, that are better and understandable and, and um, can be scaled. And you're right, business cases, um, every business model is different. Did I forget something? cannot retain our user base. What do we do with the idea? Okay, let me try to understand this. After, after doing all these processes, models, approaches, steps, if it cannot retain our user base, I don't understand. If you, if you Chandan, if you could uh, clarify that, it might just be me, uh, I don't fully follow. Um, I might just move on. Um, let's just set this overview stage anyway. So, well, so we came from here to here to here, right? And the idea is here that, or the promise is that from there to the spreadsheet, it's not so far anymore. 
Like we're coming very close to the spreadsheet now. And hopefully we took everybody on the journey. Everybody who does research, everybody who's excited about a new idea about, hey, we can deliver value here. I know people want this at least, right? Um, but their financial acumen is maybe not so, you know, not so high or they're scared of spreadsheets. Like how many people are scared of spreadsheets? Because like some folks in the organization are tremendously good and, you know, you know, hardly know how to navigate it. It's intimidating. So how do we, how do we bridge this gap? How do we bring people together and how do we make a process that works? And, I, and that's the idea here. Like now we come from this visual model that everybody understands. Now we touch a spreadsheet for the first time. Quantify the model. <coughs> so it's quite beautiful because all levers of growth, which is basically you can uh, oh, silly me, I have to jump into the actual spreadsheet. All right, let's fix this. Yeah, with me, folks. Uh, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, great. So. No, I didn't give away the growth curve either. Either great, good job, Ilya. Go. So, oh man, cut me some slack, guys. <laughs> okay, cool. We have the. Oh, what a mess. I'm bringing it up. There we go. All right, so in here, we can now, even with this basic assumptions, all blade assumptions, we can start playing around. We can start making some predictions and sanity checks again in a, in a, in a little bit more sophisticated way, right? We can say, okay, this project needs to return, needs to return a lot. We just say like, if it, what about, or like, we can already model each type of growth we have available. We can say, we can, what happens if we have more customers? What if they stick around for longer? And what if they refer a lot of folks? I'm just checking it for my notes. Are we good with time? Yeah. Cool. So we can see down here, we can play a bit with the numbers. So I'm just asking you one thing. How do we achieve exponential growth? Like what variable here do I need to modify? Like visitors come into my store, 50% of them become currently customers eating, eating lasagna. Uh, I make 20 bucks out of them. 50% of them come back every month in this current assumption here. Uh, and 50% refer. And uh, these are the costs, but let's see, I'll leave out the cost. In. Referrals and retention. What do you want me to do with either of this? What number should I put in? in referral or retention. Don't say 110 for retention, huh? for referrals. Yeah, what number should we punch in there? Nice, exactly, no idea, 75, let's just have a play. Fantastic, and what happens? 
Not yet. Imagine the business model. That's great. 75% refer. 70, 70. So next guess, what do we need to, to achieve exponential growth? When we have a hockey stick down here. Sorry for those that haven't made that clear. Let's try 80. What happens when we do 80? Not even linear. 200, 200% referral. Well, let's do, let's see, let's go up a little bit. 90, 95, 100, and that's linear growth. So in order to reach exponential growth, what do we need to fix here? Nothing. Oh, people are dropping out. Customer retention. All right, I better move on. Okay, so hello, fantastic. The work has like acquisition and so on. Okay, great. Increase referrals. Further, we can have like we can have a new idea. What if we? have a different referral model and so on. So we can refine the business model further. We can see, is there any hope? And you know, to be fair, not everybody needs exponential growth. That's not the point of the exercise here, right? Um, there, there is no, like there's no need very often. Uh, you know, you, you reach a certain point and that's fine. That's absolutely happy times. But if somebody comes in and says, we have this exponential great story, all right, show me some basic numbers and let's sanity check this in a very quick way, right? And we can also say, we can go back to our, uh, our customer journey and we can look what's wrong, what do we need to do? So this all really nicely connects. And what we can do now is already we can run an experiment and we can feed it back in here. So since it's a funnel, we have early indicators for success, right? If we say uh, we have to run Facebook ads and they're gonna bring in a thousand visitors per month and 50 of those become customers. Well, try to get a thousand people for the money that you assume onto your, onto your landing page. If that doesn't remotely work, there's no need to play with the rest. There's no need to build anything and so on. Right, so this is the stuff we're talking about every day. This is how we bring it from, uh, you know, for, for what we do into numbers, into a way that, uh, into a way that, in, into a financial model. Like that's a hypothesis-driven financial model. But we haven't really solved the other big issue. Like coming back to the beginning, like it's there's still all assumptions. The rest is still all assumptions and. If, you know, it, it's, it's still something we need to test and test and test. And it's not, it's still one number. And uh, yeah. So I'm just wondering if we should go back to the presentation here. So, but what we wanted to get to was the hurricane chart, wasn't it? Like we wanted to, we wanted to do that. And um, whoa. Oh. oh, it's nice sailing in front of techies. Doesn't make it any better. All right. Let's just, let's just bring up the spreadsheet. So what we really want is ranges. Who has heard of a Monte Carlo analysis? Is 
anybody heard of a Monte Carlo analysis before? Cool. I expected that. That's fantastic. Somebody else, a few more. Everybody has heard of it. Please say yes. Great. Oh, this is fun. Fantastic. Fantastic. So great. Lots of folks. Brilliant. Um, I'll share I'll share an article with you later. Like we what we can do. There's a big problem with usually with best case, worst case scenarios. It's usually very, very bad math. So we could say like, hey, give us the best and the worst case. And we just average it out. And then we know the most like, like, you know, we're going to hit somewhere in the middle. It's not very good math. And um, so I just want to just want to put that out there when we continue, when we talk about this now. So the beauty now is we can basically take all the stress out of predicting the future uh, for entrepreneurs. And we can take all the stress out also for business sponsors now by demanding fake accuracy, I, I think. I think we can create a lot, like a lot better relationships by using ranges. So you see here, it's a 95% confidence interval, like that's going a little bit far for today, but it's not actually saying the best case scenario. Um, it's really like, I am 90% I'm confident we will be, I'm X percent confident we will never be better than this and it will never be worse than that. And we do that for each variable and then we have ranges. So what we spoke about earlier. And that is true. That's as much as we know today, right? And we can talk about it. We have to have, have an honest conversation about it in the team with everybody. And that shows the true uncertainty. So uh, just for those who are not familiar, uh, what you do then, what you basically do is you, you brute force a calculation onto your business model once you've defined those ranges and you make like 30,000 calculations or something like that. And you pretend this business model has run a 30,000 times. Uh, it looks a bit fancy back here, but just to get a quick impression. Um, so here you have the range and then you have, uh, in this case, I think we have 300 calculations or so. Uh, and if the variable is normal distributed, it takes a bit more um, from the middle and a few less from the outliers and so on. Uh, and that's the beauty of how making it more accurate by um, not pretending that everything is linear. Uh, you can model how these variables behave, uh, variables behave together, uh, certain interdependencies and so on. And what you come up with at the end is, is the hurricane chart. And there we are. We're the meteorologists of business modeling, right? And what did we have really? We often really have an idea. We have a few assumptions, but this is really the best thing we can do in terms of predicting the future. This is the most likely outcome, you know, still possible, pretty unlikely. But as we see this calculation here is far below the, uh, what we usually take as the basic business case. So I think the one, the one point I really wanted to make is that You have a lot of uncertainty and the innovation team's job is not necessarily to come like identify the winner in the beginning, right? None of you guys should be expected to, to, to have good ideas like every single time, right? But progress should look like you're actually learning. And now you have the ability to run an experiment, to do qualitative, to get some qualitative data, to do research, and you come back and then narrow down the ranges and it should narrow down your hurricane chart. And you should be able to each week, every second week, show progress and communicate with everybody else your progress in the company. 
right? And that gets me really excited, right? So um, that's how we bridge the gap. Um, there's some lessons learned and some shameless self-promotion. We do have a course on that. Yeah. So I will stop the presentation here, I think. Maybe give me the chance to share this one link before we drop off here in case somebody wants to um, wants to do that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I hope that provided an overview of our take on innovation accounting is how we bring pirate metrics together with uh, with ranges, with better math, and how we you know treat UX teams well and the finance department well equally. Thank you.